Hello and welcome to our presentation about the Southwark Bridge layout. This presentation has been put together by Mike Day and Ted Stevens, and Ted is narrating the story. Our presentation is split into four parts covering these aspects. Each part is presented as a separate video. We'll try to demonstrate these things with illustrations and videos from the layout. In part one, we will look at the layout's origins, take a tour along the railway and the scenic areas, and describe what you would see if you were to visit. Later parts of the presentation will focus in more detail on particular aspects. First, let's take a quick journey through the layout. There are two up lines and one down. We're travelling in the up direction towards Southwark Bridge, and above us is the bee box. On the right is the necropolis siding. We go over Southwark Bridge Road. The loco yard is on the right, and the long, thin north yard for goods is on the left. Now we are approaching A box and the main station entry signals. On the left is the horse dock and on the right is the loco shed. Ahead is the station throat. Mostly platforms on our left are used for long distance and express trains with more local trains on the right. So how do we get to Southwark Bridge? by taking the lessons learned from building a previous layout. For Mike, modelling started with a layout that was largely complete when he joined the group. The layout was Winchester Chesil and was constructed mainly in the 1980s. Compare this view of the model with the following frame. This is the real Chesil and I hope it shows how closely the model reflects the real thing. The idea was that the model has a chance of looking right if you start from the real location. But before moving on, Chesil was decreed to be good enough to be purchased by Hans County Council to be put into Milestones Museum in Basingstoke. Southwark Bridge was started after Chesil was sold. Here you can see a comparison between the real layout above and what was modelled below. Chesil modelled the area from the tunnel mouth on the left to the loco yard and goods shed to the right of this map. Operationally, the station was used by both GWR and LSWR for traffic interchange. Another example from Chesil, the station building. Above right is the original station in 1960 or so, shortly before closure and many years since it last received any paint. Below is Mike Jolly's model of the main building for the station, looking reasonably clean as it is dated for 1920 in the model. Real or model? The layout was well executed scenically, with locos from Martin Finney. An example of superb modelling from Mike Jolly, with the execution of the barrel vaulted building, and the real thing is still there, looking exactly like this. There are many people who contributed to Chesil as part of the Southampton area group. Mike Jolly? He went on to be mostly a 7mm broad gauge modeller, so this is his P4 memorial. Mike Jolly passed away some time ago, as did Ivan Smith, who started our little layout of Southwark Bridge. Southwark Bridge was very much Ivan's design, but he welcomed others chipping in. Chesil was exhibited for the last time at Scale Forum 1996 and is captured in the exhibition video now available on YouTube. View this from minute 25 onwards to get a glimpse of Chesil in action. And here is the building in which the layout is housed in Milestone's Museum of Transport in Hampshire at Basingstoke, a mini replica of the original station. So the key takeaways from Chesil were to accurately model reality. Real places, real buildings, real stock and a real timetable. Now let's move on to look at Southwark Bridge. The station throat area was the start of the project. Ivan Smith built a plethora of London and Southwestern style points and join them together to form a station throat. He asked Henry Boucher to suggest an LSWR solution to signalling it, and Henry was immediately struck by its similarity to an earlier incarnation of Southwark Bridge, a layout that he had a hand in building, but was not completed as two out of the three owners passed away. 
we were pleased to get it going again and Henry duly designed the sickling. The layout has been exhibited a couple of times in the past and was first shown at Scale Forum 1995 in its bare board state. Some ten years later an article was published in Scale 4 News number 149 with scenery in embryo form as captured in this photo. Since then we have concentrated on producing the rolling stock required and much more scenery. Very early in the project Henry Boucher drew up a 24 page document which described the services to be run, the period and what we were trying to achieve. This determined what stock would be required and the platform capacity of the terminus. Key things in this document were the date and the proportion of trains in the original timetable that would go through to the city terminus. The date chosen was 1912 because this was the zenith of steam operations on the southwestern. Thereafter electrification was introduced and this simplified things. October was chosen as this would be during winter timetable when there were less duplicated trains i.e. we wouldn't need to build so much stock. And it was a very elegant age, allowing us to model clean trains and well-kept stations. We reckon that the capacity for the layout and operators would be 12 trains per hour in each direction. Whilst this doesn't sound a lot, remember that for each train there are at least four moves to turn the train round. Train arrives, light engine from loco yard to outer end of train, ready to depart, train departs, light engine from incoming train to loco yard. In addition, race traffic was an important source of income, not only transporting passengers on race day, but also all the special workings required to deliver the horses to the racetracks. Here is a horse box train arriving. On top of this, there were empty stock movements to and from Clapham Yard associated with express services as well as express loco movements to and from Nine Elms. The delight of this document is identifying the trains and where they went to. Not just the London suburbs, but long distance ones to places like Padstow and Plymouth, both expresses and incredibly slow. From time to time there are also freight workings, usually associated with perishable goods such as milk or fish. To set the scene, the LSWR built Waterloo as a through station and applied for an Act of Parliament to extend to or near to London Bridge. The Act was passed in 1846. In the event, the LSWR line was never extended due to the financial sentiment in the late 40s turning against the railways. The need for a connection to the city remained and eventually the Waterloo and City Tube Line was built in 1892 otherwise known as the drain. Philip Woods' extensive researches over many years led to this map of the first Waterloo station. Note the lack of thick wall on the right-hand end of the track, where the extension to London Bridge was envisaged. This map is dated 1895, but the layout remained largely unaltered until the rebuilding got underway in 1899. When started, the additional platforms were positioned over the South Station and it took some 23 years to rebuild the whole station, although interrupted by the First World War. So for the most part, this layout style shown in this map will suit the Southwark Bridge design modelled in 1912. Waterloo in our era had 21 platforms. Our station operating one third of the services consequently has seven lines of which six have platform faces. On the left, the country end of the terminus, we have two up lines, up through and up local, and one down line. There is also a short section of down relief line to allow the clearing of a platform, but with the capacity to hold a full length train before crossing to the down. Waterloo had six bi-directional running lines across the station throat. We have three plus the relief line as mentioned earlier. The up through, up local and down applies to the main lines. At the station throat around A box, the lines are lettered from top to bottom as C, B and A, whilst the relief is R. The reason being that lettered lines are bi-directional. Here are two views of the layout. 
On the left, you are looking from country end towards the city terminus. On the right, the view from Southwark Bridge. It's a long layout extending 45 feet from station to the fiddle yard. And representing the rest of the world, or at least the LSWR, we have our fiddle yard ably run by David and Alistair on one of our running days. The fiddle yard uses cassettes to manage the stock, comprising some 35 locos and 200 items of rolling stock. Let's now take a tour along the railway from fiddle yard to terminus. The front end of the fiddle yard holds trains ready to depart, but is fully modelled as part of the layout. The assembled trains or light engines depart along either of the two up lines. The gasworks, of which more later in the presentation, forms a scenic break for viewers normally on the other side of the layout. First we come to the Necropolis station. This was the main office and mortuary of the London Necropolis Company, which was in reality at Waterloo until 1942, when it was largely destroyed during an air raid. For our purposes, we have moved it to just outside Southwark Bridge, and it occupies a siding off the down line. It looks rather busy here as B-Box straddles the main lines and the signalers access steps and bridge span the entry to the necropolis platforms. The single line access splits into two platforms, one for first class and another for third class, and a head shunt is provided to split trains to suit the platforms. In this aerial shot of the necropolis station, we have from the left the necropolis main building, the platforms, and a typical M7 with some six-wheeler coaches, which operated the service to Brookwood Cemetery. Behind is our version of Rupel Street with some 1820s buildings. Adjacent to the Necropolis building, we have the Signal Bridge. The equivalent of this bridge at Waterloo is one of the longest serving items of infrastructure at Waterloo, and it is still there. Moving along the layout, we come to A Box, North Yard and Loco Yard. The North Yard has a direct connection to Line 7 to the right, as well as a connection to the up through shown in the middle of this track plan. The Loco Yard has the capacity to accommodate seven locos and several more arriving or awaiting departure. To make matters more tricky, there is often a Loco coal train occupying one line in the yard. Southwark Bridge Road Bridge is a major structure. The Loco standing on it is our G6 shunter with shunting truck, and it acts as the station pilot. From this position in North Yard, it can gain direct access to any platform for adding and removing stock and tail traffic. All London terminals had huge signal boxes. Waterloo had 10 signalers as well as booking clerks, supported by varying numbers of ground shunters who hand signaled drivers and gave verbal instruction. The signals on our A box would have been 70 feet high, in reality making them impossible to read in foggy conditions. The hedgerow of signals on A box from right to left apply to the lines 1 to 7 in our terminus. Whilst line 5 does not have a platform, it can have trains signalled into it. The upper signal on each post is for trains approaching on the up through line. The next signal down is for trains approaching on the up local, and for shunt-in moves, for light engines and tail traffic, there is a third line of signals. Under the cabin, the shunt-in signals are replicated from above and are easier to see for the driver. On our layout, there are shunt-in signals for each of the reversible lines in the station throat. The prototype had six. As mentioned earlier, there was a limited amount of goods traffic into Waterloo, and we have replicated this on Southwark Bridge, and it is dealt with in North Yard. Here we have a train consisting of a 44-foot van, an open carriage truck with SIDS removal van on it, and a few works train vehicles arriving in Platform 7, ready to be shunted back into North Yard. In the North Yard there is a horse dock and a bullion dock, Bullion vehicles were required for gold and banknote traffic to Southampton docks and were often attached as tail traffic to boat trains. The horse dock was used for handling private carriages and their horses. These were accommodated as tail traffic on passenger service trains and could be provided at short notice. It also handled a limited amount of goods, 
such as hay traffic for locally stabled horses, which is what is under the tarpaulin on this wagon. On the other side of the main line, the loco yard provides coaling facilities and turning for engines, mostly associated with suburban services. The coal is loaded into tubs and then craned into the loco bunkers. Most of the locos visiting the shed were tank engines, M7s, O2s and the like, although there was space on the turntable to accommodate small tender locos such as a Jubilee. The body of the shed is laser cut, the roof is card slates and the metal window frames are etched. No details have come to light about the little shed that used to be under the Waterloo roof, although there is a photograph taken during demolition showing the front of the shed on which our design is based. Here is our representation with a rather important visitor, Mr Drummond's car. A quick look inside reveals a rather clean and tidy shed. The shed can accommodate four locos and these are detected using pulsed LED light and a tuned circuit detector, which displays on the loco yard operator's diagram which track is occupied. And of course the turntable with M7 number 52 on it. Now let's look at the terminus. There are seven lines of which six are served by platform faces. Line five in the middle is used for run round and holding locos and stock. The suburban services generally use lines one to four, whilst the longer distance services use three to six. Looking across the station throat, you can see the low numbered platforms with an M7 and a four and a half set departing from line one. From the other side of the track, here you can see an express in line seven ready to depart. See how the train completely fills the platform. It has two vans, a dining car set and a four coach set, and the train is double headed with locos fouling the station throat. Just like the real thing. Now we're going to work back towards the fiddle yard looking at the buildings and scenery. The station canopy is based on the one at Portsmouth and South Sea. This has not been much altered, but Waterloo has lost all its 19th century roofing. Larger station buildings had this style of roofing, with cast and lattice trusses supported on cast iron columns. The model building made of card at the top of the picture is the base of the crow's nest signal box, which controlled entry to the platforms. The main roof trusses are made up from etched components. Each etch is about 8 inches long, comprising 40 items, enough for one truss, and there are 30 or so trusses in each span, so some 1200 parts per platform. At the buffer stop there is a billboard for the timetable. On the platform there is a taxi rank, and by 1912 motor taxis were becoming more common, so we built a small fleet. Here you can see a couple of these disappearing down the access ramp on the platform between lines 6 and 7. More details about how the models were made are given in a later video in this series. The railings surrounding the taxi rank are based on those at Clapham Junction, as shown on the right. Our model on the left reproduces these as closely as we can, and here you can see Mr Drummond's car with some admirers. All of the lines are built on a viaduct some 20 feet above the adjacent ground. This gives a constrained setting for the trains, with limited clearance between the lines. We're still in the throes of putting together the street scene. Many of the buildings are complete, but we have yet to develop the tram that will eventually run through here. The railway is up to the right on the viaduct. On the right we have the necropolis building main entrance, with hearse and plumed black horses, built tight up against the railway viaduct. The horse water trough is based on one of the remaining examples in London, now commonly used as planters. The building contained offices, storage, mortuary, chapel of rest and lifts up to the platforms. The necropolis platforms are supported by an iron viaduct. Here is a view showing the construction. The metalwork is made of odds and ends of tube and scrap etch from the leftovers box. For our street scene we chose to base it on Rupel Street, a nice early 19th century road not far from Waterloo Station. Certainly these buildings were there in 1912, so suitable for our street scene, 
although I suspect the pub frontage in the photo on the left is a bit over the top for our date. Our rendition is simplified with two separate bar entrances and no money wasted on the outside. The cottages are modelled as they were built in the 1820s. A little further along the street we have this rather nice terrace with steps going down to the basement. As would be typical of that time there is a corner shop tobacconist and a more recent addition is the Homewood building in stark contrast to the rest of the street. More details about this in a later presentation. At the end of the layout, just before the fiddle yard, we have a gas works to act as a scenic break. This has been designed to give a cramped feel to the site whilst containing models of all the items of equipment required for a viable gas works. Again, more details about the gas works are given in a later presentation. Building all of this, as you can imagine, is thirsty work, so we have a selection of local pubs. Here is the Rosen Crown, and then we have the White Hart. Both of these pubs still exist. Finally, a glimpse at how the layout is controlled. From an operator's perspective, a box is run by two signalers. One is allocated to arrivals, the other to departures. When built it was thought that 120 levers would be overkill, but most of them that were spare are now in use. Lever pulls are recognised by the interlocking computer and before any action is taken the validity is checked. In the event of an error a buzzer sounds. Drivers have to drive according to the signals and any spads are met with the usual heckling. The 120 levers in a box control the main line arrivals and departures. Also there are three sub boxes controlling various local areas. The local yard operator has its own frame as has the north yard. Both of these have to give entry control release to a box before it can signal in locos or trains to these yards. In addition the platform area of the station has its own box known as the crow's nest. Nearly defunct by our date but it still required permission from this box to allow entry into the platform. The purpose of this was to allow shunting to take place in the platforms and dates back to the days of wagon turntables. Behind the scenes the interlocking is detected by a plethora of electronics and managed by a program running on a Raspberry Pi hidden away in a box on the middle shelf. There are over 300 connections from the A box to the layout. The clock required for the timetable is also controlled by a Raspberry Pi located on this shelf. At the bottom are the main power supply transformers. Above the lever frame we have two signal diagrams. On the left is for the departures, the one on the right is for arrivals. In the middle we have a tablet PC which is used to display the timetable for the signalers. All trains entering or leaving the station are offered and accepted with the fiddle yard using bell codes. We use a subset of bell codes which represent the trains that we operate. The codes are based on those in use by the LSWR in 1912. That concludes our tour of Southwark Bridge and what you would see on a visit. Please view subsequent videos in this series to find out more about how we operate the railway, the stock we run and how we develop models for the layout. Thank you for viewing this and we hope you found it of interest.